as you have you seen my, my message this morning, the title of it is Certain Hope of Future Glory. And uh, the main theme of the message is going to be talking about that future glory that all believers will have when Christ returns to this earth. We know that there is uh, a glory that's revealed to every believer in the face of Jesus Christ. We know that every believer at the new birth, when God opens our eyes and our minds to see who Christ is and what he did in our place as our substitute and surety, we know that that, that is a glory where Christ is revealed as our righteousness before God. But we're going to be talking about that future glory uh, this morning more than anything else. Uh, before I begin uh, with verse 18, which is going to be the main verse that we'll begin with this morning in our study, I want to read a little bit and quote John Gill, an old writer, uh, and what he says concerning some of these verses here that will give us a good idea of what I'll be talking about. John Gill says, The future happiness of the saints is expressed by glory, of which the glory of this world is but a faint resemblance, a glory which is already given to Christ, and he has entered into the possession of it. But as yet, in the believer, it is unseen, but will be revealed hereafter, when Christ himself shall appear in it. And it will not only be revealed to the saints, as the glory of Christ as mediator, and it will not only be visible upon them, upon the believers, but also upon their bodies, upon our bodies, as they're made new, which will be made like to the glorious body of Christ. This glory will not only be revealed upon our bodies, but it will be revealed also in them, in the believer and greatly lie in the perfection and the knowledge and holiness in their souls. Now, between the sufferings of the saints in the present state of things and their future happiness, there's no comparison, either with respect to the quality or the quantity of it. The sufferings of the saints are but for a time on this earth, but their glory is eternal." End of quote. I begin this message with a statement that I just quoted in order to give everyone an idea of the main theme of the message, which is, no matter how much that believers suffer in this life, no matter how much they suffer in this life, nothing will compare to our final glory in our eternal life in Christ our Savior. Nothing will compare to what we'll see when Christ returns. There are different interpretations concerning exactly what the creature or the creation is in these verses that I'm going to go over this morning. Some theologians say it refers to the Gentiles. Others say it refers to God's entire creation. This is everything that God created. And others point out to this creation being the church of God. But all of them have one thing in common, and they point to nothing, nothing that rivals our final glory and eternal life in Christ. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on this morning in our study. So as we begin with verse 18 of Romans 8, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul had endured much suffering over the gospel of God's grace in Christ. He knew that all God's children suffer for righteousness to one degree or the other. He wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul had been from the lowest point of suffering great persecution to the highest point a man could ever go in this life in that he had an actual sight of the glory of heaven in Christ. 
Let's look at what Paul says concerning his revelation or this vision here. 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 1. Paul says, It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. This was Paul's vision that he had here. So, uh, like I said, he, he had his lowest point of persecution, but he also had uh, his highest point concerning his vision. He knew firsthand that even though our sufferings here on earth are painful and grievous, and we don't make light of them, they cannot compare to our future glory, which will be revealed to us when Christ comes again in the end. Our sufferings here on earth, well, they're only temporary, according to 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, where Peter says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our glory in heaven is eternal. In Romans 8, 19, it reads, For the earnest expectation of the creature, or the creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This earnest expectation means an anxious longing. It is like a stretching forth of the head as an indication of an expectation of seeing or realizing something afar off in distance. The phrase waiteth for the manifestation or waiting for the revelation or uncovering of the sons of God, we know that there is a manifestation of the sons of God at the new birth. But this manifestation here in verse 19 that we're talking about is the time of the Lord's return to gather his church unto himself and destroy this present creation as it is under the curse of sin. He will make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. The whole creation, not only God's elect, but all the earth, shall be delivered from the curse and restored to the perfect state of perfection. All of God's elect who have been chosen, justified, redeemed, adopted, and born again children of God should certainly set our affections and desires and goals on things above. Look at Colossians 3 and beginning at verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now our next verse, in verse 20, reads, For the creature of the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. The creature here is the creation that Paul speaks of in the previous verse. The creation was not brought under the curse of sin and futility by any act of its own will in disobedience. It came under the curse and futility of sin because of Adam who sinned willfully and willingly. In Genesis 3 and beginning at verse 17, it says, and, and to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Sin entered the world and spread to all men, and the effects of death spread to all creation, 
because of sin's entrance into creation. Not only did our whole race fall into bondage of sin and death, but the entire physical universe fell as well. Everything that God made. The last part of Romans 8.20 says, Subject at the same in hope. This means that the whole creation was placed under the curse of sin, but in hope of future deliverance. Here we see the purpose of God in creation and the fall of man, which is God's glory and salvation and the salvation of his people and the whole creation as well. All of this in and by the death, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explains this in the next verse, here in verse 21, where Paul says, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from bondage of corruption until the glorious liberty of the children of God. Not only will God's children be finally and fully delivered from the bondage of corruption until the glorious liberty of the children of God, by the second coming of Christ, but the whole creation will also be delivered from this bondage and made eternally and fully new. Everything that God created. The bondage of corruption refers to the remaining presence and effects of sin, with which we as believers are still plagued while on this earth. Our complete justification and redemption from all sin is a completed act and accomplished by the death of Christ on the cross. Look at Romans 6, 3 through 7 that tells us this. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, henceforth we should not serve sin. But he that is dead is freed from sin. Our complete, full, and final deliverance from the remaining effects of sin is sure and certain because of the power of Christ and what he did in our room and in our stead. But this, but this deliverance is also a future deliverance and that it's sure to take place at Christ's second coming. This is the future liberty from sin of which Paul speaks back in Romans 8, last part of verse 21, where it reads the glorious liberty of the children of God. Our next verse, verse 22, says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. The whole creation is like a woman groaning and travailing in childbirth, expectantly awaiting the birth of a, he of a healthy child. This is the expectation of every true believer in Christ as we await in expectation the glory of that is to come. The until now here simply means that creation has grown and travailed in the past. It continues to do so even now and will continue to do so in the future until we no more experience sin and corruption. This is the future now of the glory that we will. We will see and experience in Christ when he returns again. Our last verse that we're going to look at this morning is verse 23, where Paul says, And not only they, and we have different uh, commentators that talks about this, not only they, some of them say it's the Gentiles that, that, uh, that are out there that have been converted and that they, their hope is that there will be many more that will be converted in the future. And, uh, but, and some of them even say it's God's entire creation, the earth, and everything in, in the earth. But it says, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirits. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, even believers that have the first fruit, awaiting for the adoption 
to wit, the redemption of our body. If the whole creation longs for its final deliverance from all the effects of sin, how much more should we, as joint heirs with Christ, truly long to be delivered from all that makes us groan and travail, and be delivered unto all that brings uh, all that brings perfect and continual joy. We who have been born again know that by the establishment of that everlasting righteousness by Christ alone, Christ actually redeemed each and every one of his sheep 2,000 years ago. Christ did this in his own person as our representative and surety. We as believers have this blessed knowledge. We have that right now. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 12. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now that sounds like a finished work to me. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. We know that we have been fully and finally redeemed from condemnation. But we have not experienced the redemption of our bodies until we are delivered from the grave and reunited with our resurrected bodies. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 50, that you hear read a lot at funerals. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the last part of Romans eight twenty three says, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The waiting for the adoption here refers to the next phrase, to wit, or namely, or in other words, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, waiting for the adoption, or in other words, the redemption of our bodies. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about that adoption that, uh, that happened in eternity when God adopted us in Christ Jesus. We're talking about waiting for the redemption of our bodies when Christ returns. The adoption here does not refer to our original adoption as sons in the everlasting covenant of grace wherein we were given to Christ, to surety, and our representative. The adoption here refers to the manifestation of it on resurrection morning. God has given the believer the earnest of that inheritance by the gift of the Holy Spirit, which assures us that we have been adopted into Christ and that we will receive all grace here and all glory hereafter, all based on Christ's work on our behalf, his righteousness alone imputed, accounted to us. The waiting for the adoption will be when all the election of grace, all God chose in eternity, will not only by faith understand and believe that we have been adopted into Christ, but we will actually experience the reality of our being adopted into Christ. God will resurrect our bodies, and once again, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up into victory. This full and final glorification of the body, both body and soul, is what the apostle encourages us to long for and fully expect 
in order to comfort us during all our trials and affliction on this, life, on this earth, in this life. We can comfort ourselves and each other during our walk of faith and in the midst of all these afflictions, knowing that the victory is certain, not based on our works or anything that we might do or be able to do, but based entirely on Christ's blood and his righteousness alone, according to God's promise. We are assured of this within ourselves, as we as believers, according to 8, Romans 8, 23, have the first fruits of the Spirit. And we, we obtain that, we get that at the new birth. The new birth and the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is, is according to Ephesians 1, 14, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession until the praise of his glory. This very truth established in our hearts is the basis of all our hope in this life. Amen.